Oh, so I'm Paul Collier and I'm running a, a project within our sort of micro hub on British regional economic divergence. So I wanted to talk about that project in this context and also relate it to what you've heard before. Um, uh, um, so Britain is at the extreme end of um, regional divergence. Um, um, if you compare the, across the OECD, where of all the major economies in the OECD, we've got the, the most extreme um, trends to, 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 to spatial divergence. Um, um, the, the, the European expert here, who's actually just received the European Prize for Regional Studies, um, Philip McCann, who's part of our team, um, describes as the only society in the OECD that has actually shriveled to a core periphery problem. When I was a kid, I grew up with development studies on very poor countries, um, which, which use this concept core periphery, and, you know, has come home to roost in Britain. Um, the, um, and, the, and the core in Philip's analysis basically shriveled to London and its regions. And every region of Britain other than London uh, is below or at um, the capita mean income. Everywhere, every, basically everywhere but, but London is below it, with the one exception which I'll come to, which is Edinburgh. Um, and it's interesting why Edinburgh has managed to buy the trend. So I'll talk about that. Um, but London is, um, is, is managed to produce astonishingly high productivity for the people grouped in it, as have many other OECD metropoles. But London is at the sort of extreme end of that. Um, and this is economic theory of, of agglomeration, which Tony Venables and I have sort of built, which shows why you can expect that and why um, the globalization that we talked about earlier has accentuated that, has produced more markets are globally tradable, and so there's room for fewer but bigger winners. Um, in the process, um, some provincial cities that either used to be national winners, which have become global, or used to become used to be global winners that have, as Deirdre said, basically shifted, like my own hometown of Sheffield, which used to be world centre in steel, um, has now become a broken city. So that, that's, uh, you've seen that in the film of Full Monty. Um, um, so, um, at the same time as London is astonishingly good at mapping inputs into income, it's immensely productive, it is immensely bad at mapping income into well-being. Um, although London is way, way, way the highest productivity area of the country, it's way, way at the bottom in the whole of the United Kingdom uh, in well-being per capita. And so if you think of it as sort of equivalent to these measures of how do you turn, you know, how much carbon do you emit from a given unit of income, to how much well-being do you emit from a given unit of income, London is staggeringly inefficient, off the map inefficient. Right? Um, uh, and yet we've got the system where young people have to herd to London to become productive, where they then become unhappy. Um, the, and we've got um, Britain's, uh, we've got Britain's top uh, sociologist uh, of this sort of stuff, a political sociologist, Steve Fisher, um, analysing that. Um, uh, I wanted to pick up on what Patricia talked about, um, and in, uh, which is this sort of, oh, vicious, no, actually this is David's stuff, David Tucker's stuff, the, the vicious circles of self-fulfilling narratives. And David, I wasn't here for your talk yesterday, but I assume it had something to do with radical uncertainty and, um, um, and how people navigate through radical uncertainty by means of narratives that circulate within a group. And uh, one of the explanations for the global financial crisis was, uh, a, a narrative circulated within the financial community, and it all acted on that same belief, um, and uh, and that drove a, that created a bubble, uh, which then blew up, um, 
Um, the peculiarity of spatial narratives, in contrast to the sort of narratives that circulated in the financial community, the peculiarity is that to a considerable extent they're self-fulfilling. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew managed to develop a narrative in Singapore that this was the city of the future, and so uh, you know, he stationed firms confidently invested in Singapore, and guess what? It became the city of the future. Right? My relatives live in Rotherham, um, which has a rather different narrative, and sure enough, uh, you know, Rotherham, Rotherham struggles. It is trapped by that, by that narrative. Um, um, the, um, we're now working, David and I, with Andy Haldane, on massive Bank of England data set, where we'll be trying to look at regional variation in the narratives that circulate in the, in the, in the regional communities and see to what extent that helps to account for, um, uh, for, for areas of success, like Edinburgh, um, and areas of, uh, of, of persistent failure, um, we've been asked to collaborate with the government of Wales. I'm off next month to, to Wales to work with them because that's the poorest region in mainland Britain. <coughs> Strong contrast to, to, to Edinburgh. Um, and then I pick up to, to Patricia's really important insights on mindsets and this contrast between zero sum mindsets and, um, and positive sum. And what she was describing in psychologist language, if we just translated it into uh, economics without all the ridiculous formulas that David joked about, um, uh, we need the, the mathematical concept of, of ergodic. And that is that the beliefs, both positive sum and zero sum, produce outcomes which then map back in to confirm the beliefs. And that produces a locally stable equilibrium. The belief of zero sum is locally stable equilibrium, as is the belief in positive sum. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and that, if I could just enlarge on that, and I, I want to add one element which might, this is, this is dialogue between economists and psychologists, and, the upshot is very likely that the economists will get egg on our face, but let's try. <laughs> so um, I see the zero-sum mindset as working like this. The first stage is not going to be controversial. But if you believe in zero-sum mindset, all that's left to you is oppositional identities. Um, and the oppositional identities basically produce narratives of grievance, which is also sort of God. Um, but grievance is by its nature backward-looking. It's about what your group did to mine in the past. And so you're trapped in a blame game. That is what the narrative constitutes, a blame game looking backwards to the past. Right? That's what produces, that's the, the, the narrative traps you in that mindset and the outcomes confirm it and all that. But it's a backward looking, um, oppositional set of identities. And the positive sum mindset starts from a sense of shared belonging, common purpose, but the common purpose is for collaboration is necessarily what we're going to do. It's forward-looking. And so I want to contrast the backward-looking narrative of the zero-sum mindset with the forward-looking narrative of common purpose. So I'm going to put that time element in, and it might not be right, but that's, that's the sort of hypothesis. Um, and, um, and of course, it, there's one other element, which I think has sort of got that if you're, the, the, the backward-looking grievance narratives um, are basically disempowering, because they're saying, I'm a victim. Whereas the forward-looking of analysis of common action is empowering because it stresses your own agency in building your future fate. So it's a victimhood backward looking versus a, an agency forward looking. Um, and now I want to relate that in my last few minutes to, um, to first to uh, Edinburgh, to explain a bit of Edinburgh's success, and then to work we're doing with the British Local Government Association 
um, and its chairman, Chris Bradley, who took me on Wednesday to spend the day with his local government authority, and I tried all these ideas out with his management team. So I will eventually tell you, you know, what, what resonated and what produced uh, ridicule, right? Um, so, um, Edinburgh. Um, Edinburgh, I think, has inadvertently hit on a formula for, um, for spatial success, for locational success. And it, it has five elements plus uh, a behavioral, the, basically plus the mindset stuff. So the five elements, if you like, structural elements. One is um, you need uh, empowered local government. And this is the multi-level right, uh, um, government stuff that you've got to have some enough decentralization of power. Britain is the most centralized government structure in, in the whole of Europe, even more centralized than France. Right? So, um, uh, but the exception is Scotland, in a, because of a, concept, a byproduct of Scottish nationalism. You know. um, they were bought off with devolution of power. And so you've got empowered local government here. You don't have it pretty well anywhere else. Right? Second component uh, is a, uh, a, a local financial industry. And that's very important because finance always starts local. All the, you know, the 19th century banks are always locally based. But, and, and, and that's there's a good reason for that, which is finance is intensely uh, uh, information intensive. You've got to learn which firms you can trust to lend to. Uh, and that has a high component, is a very complex process. And we know that the more complex a decision, the greater the ratio of tacit knowledge to codifiable knowledge. In the rest of Brit Britain, at the end of the 19th century, uh, central, the, the commercial banking got centralized to manage the, the risk problem inherent in having all your rates in a one city basket. Germany got over the same problem by an insurance system and kept its finance industry local. Britain didn't, with the exception of the finance industry in Edinburgh, which was there, kept separate because Scottish law said. Basically, that was the anomaly. But because of that, Scotland's Edinburgh has retained the, the tacit knowledge in financial decisions, whereas my hometown, Sheffield, you go to the bank and want to borrow, the, the, all the local uh, guy in the bank does is fill a form in, which shrivels to only codifiable knowledge. It then goes into to London, where it's cranked into a risk-weighted model and spits out an answer. Um, so all the tacit knowledge is lost. So that's why it's important to get local finance. Edinburgh's got it. Virtually no other city in Britain apart from London has it, the bit in Leeds. Um, the, where you get local devolved political power and local financial power, the business community naturally organises locally. If you don't have either of those, there's not much point in the businesses organising locally, and so they organise nationally. And so the rest of Britain, you know, the Confederation of British Industries and all that jazz is London, but Edinburgh has Scottish business. Uh, very important, so you've got a business community organised, so that the firms can talk to the, the local government and finance, not just with individual lobbying, but collectively. And the collective then filters out the individual interest and just speaks for the, the, the common business. Um, and the fourth element is uh, universities, and I don't know, two of them, good ones. Right? Universities matter in two ways, potentially. One is they produce the uh, training for the, the business, for the jobs that are in the, the city. Uh, and the other is they produce the research for the firms in the city that keeps them around the frontier right? of what's going on globally. Um, uh, Edinburgh's got that. Um, elsewhere in the UK, the uh, incentive for the uh, local universities tends not to be to meet the interests of the local community. Um, I was recently in uh, Queen's University, Belfast, and I had dinner with the Vice-Chancellor, who told me, obviously, 
the, what, we, what I should be doing is building the next generation of bright young people equipped to take the Northern Irish economy forward. That's pretty necessary. It's the poorest region in the whole of the United Kingdom. <laughs> um, he said, I can't afford to do that. My entire funding model depends on winning research contracts. And there, I'm on a level playing field with Oxbridge. And so my game, to win that game, I've got to find out whatever sectors, whatever topics is Oxford and Cambridge not doing particularly well. You know? So if, it's, if they're neglecting Assyrian ancient history, I'm going to be big on Assyrian ancient history. Yeah? Um, that's not a lot of use for taking the 21st century economy of Northern Ireland forward, but it's a way of funding Queen's Belfast. Right? So that's where we are. But Edinburgh's out of that problem because it's got local funding. Um, then um, finally, every locality, place, people send, if, if, if things play right, people belong to place. And for that, the place needs some cultural identities, brand in, in commercial terms. And Edinburgh pioneered that in the whole of Europe. Um, last month I was here for the Edinburgh Festival. Um, so was my 18-year-old who'd come when he was 17, and all his friends had applied to Edinburgh University because I am told Edinburgh is really cool. <laughs> um, uh, and there were, the, the population of Edinburgh doubles during the wars because there's just, you know, there's half a million foreigners coming, basically. So it's, it's, it's phenomenal. So that's cultural branding. Those five things are sort of a cocktail, but then you need a mindset of collaboration. So those five things have got to work together. Now, 10 years ago, uh, those five entities did come together in Edinburgh, and they posed the question, where are the jobs going to come from 10, 20 years time? And then they weren't very imaginative. Um, but what they did was think, well, let's get a sector. Let's try and attract a sector which is going to be a future sector. Right? And they thought, IT, that seems to be a sector of the future. So it wasn't high-level research, it was just, you know, what's in the newspapers, um, IT. And then they thought to do an inventory of how many IT firms have we actually got in Edinburgh. Well, 10 years ago, they got two. Right? Okay, so they all start, all the, you know, the universities, the range of courses and so on, the finance the industry goes out hunting and so on and so forth. Um, uh, I was here in January to check out how they do um, it's 10 years on, they've now got 480 IT firms. It's the largest single cluster in the whole of Europe. Right? So, it works. Positive some mindset, forward-looking, let's work together, each do our bit. Right? Um, I'll draw to a close, but um, um, we're now taking this around the Britain's local government authorities working, as I said, with the, with the chair of the local government association and prospectively with government of Wales, which is the other end of the spectrum from, uh, from Edinburgh. Um, and so Wednesday, I tried all these ideas out um, on the, the management team uh, of this, this district council in a, in a district which is um, rather poor, rather low skilled, um, and, uh, and many of the ideas resonate, but the one that was most, was, was hit most successfully uh, was the idea of the zero-sum mindset because it had been exactly what was your phrase um, an implicit belief and by talking through it it surfaced as an explicit belief because what they've been talking to me about was that their problems were partly because of Portsmouth City Council, which was next door to them, that was the enemy. There was a bigger enemy called Hampshire County Council, which was really sort of the devil incarnate. And then the whole challenge was how could they get stuff to come to their area and not the neighboring local government entities. So the whole thing was framed in a zero-sum game. And during the day, they started to see that of themselves and of their neighbours. And so they said, 
what can we do about it to change it? How can we change, and this is back to polycentric governance where we started, how can we change the structures so that we've actually got structures which encourage us to collaborate and can you bring your team in to teach us how to do it? So that's what we've got to do. Thank you.